Okay, let's make a sound. <coughs> Evening, welcome to Real Love Guitars under the white LED lights with twinkly lights in the background just this once for Christmas minded people. Da, 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 da. Can't obviously see them in this lighting, but um, they really are there. Anyway, uh, it's Saturday night, it's all right, um, and we have Drew's. Gibson Les Paul Custom <laughs> Les Paul Custom 1997 wine red double bound critter. Oh look we've got a bit of separation down there. Oh this is becoming a commonplace. Maybe it is commonplace. A little separation between the binding and the body with a resultant slight cracking in the finish, only minor. Um, mind you, this is a an oldish guitar, so you know it's pretty good for having lived all those years. So what have we got it in for? This is, um, I've got two cameras running here, so we've got a sort of, well, I can do this for close-ups, okay? Wow, well, look at that. Ain't that beautiful? Oh, you don't get to see it over there, but I will intercut this, of course. So we have lovely gold hardware. Um, it's a two-piece cap, maple cap, with deep wine red um, finish. Faded gold, double band. Um, heavy I didn't weigh it it's got a dent in the neck uh, there unfortunately you know one of those things that years of uh, real life and it isn't bad considering and um, so we've got a lovely old custom I say 1997 that's as much as I know it's got a uh, a that neck um, I, uh, ivory ebony ebony ivory um, it's got the sort of top hat things, uh, three-way selector. We've got the Goto, no, Shala strap lock fittings on there. And generally, uh, a nice old beastie. It's got a hand-finished nut, um, which has been, I guess, probably done many years ago, possibly way, way back in the, uh, the original days when the nut was, when the guitar was first made. Um, now, the thing that interests me about this is I played this guitar the other night, and I'm not a great player, uh, as you already know, but it was an incredible experience because I loved how it sounded straight away on my little my little tiny amp at home, and uh, it was just gorgeous. And straight away I thought, hmm, there's something about this that I just love the tone, and I played for an hour, not, you know, just noodling around for an hour, and I and I absolutely loved how it sounded, um, and it just felt like something completely different from some of the more recent ones. Now I know this is probably a part of this is now going to be you could accuse it of being psychological. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, these are I presume they're the standard Gibson four nine eight for whatever it was pickup and four something eight. Don't know the numbers. I'm not an expert in Gibsons or their their, um, their uh, pickups, but it just sounded wonderful, and and I just enjoyed it. And it, it it felt like I was playing something unusually good or something special, and I like that feeling. And how how much of that is is as I say psychological? You know, you're playing an old guitar, and it's got the huge Gibson weight, and and also, but the the. The, um, the pickups, just I loved the tone that was coming out right there and then. So it was a good impression. And um, so Drew uh, asked me to set this up for him. Ages back, um, Drew sent me a Thomas Blug uh, v, Vintage V6 Strat, um, which I really enjoyed setting up as well. Um, and it's a, that's a nice guitar. And, and um, so Drew came back to me just recently saying would I set this one up and he said he would like uh, a, uh, an, a an adjustable nut. Now you know I've had discussions with Drew and other owners about the non-standardness obviously of the adjustable nut device. Here we are in close-up. Now you, the adjustable nut is something that makes the guitar obviously non-standard but 
Apart from um, taking up the slight bit of finish where it overlays the end of the nut, um, that's the only modification it makes to the guitar. We basically adjust the nut to make it fit the guitar, which is, looks like it's pretty much absolutely spot on. These inserts, by the way, were made for Gibson Les Pauls by Graf Tech. Um, and the story behind them is that for a while, I can't remember what year it was now, but um, Gibson started making the zero, the brass zero fret, adjustable zero fret nut. Um, and it's like they hadn't learned anything throughout their history about zero fret, uh, zero frets, because the first thing that happens to zero frets without fail is that they notch with strings lying on them uh, 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. So you're guaranteed to get notching. Um, even if the guitar isn't played, and that's a bit of a bummer because what it means is really is that the guitar can sit in a, a showroom for you know brand new, and yet by the time it's sold, if it's a couple of months after um, it's come out of the factory or six months even, by the time it's sold, it will it may very likely already have the um, the notches in the in the actually in the what's called the zero fret down there. Um, so. I think uh, it obviously came a point where Gibson figured that out and they um, they replaced it with, I think, a titanium one, um, which is a much better idea. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Graftech saw an opportunity and very smartly came out with, let me just show it here, this little um, adjustable nut insert, which you can see I'm winding, winding up on little grub screws. Okay, so that's the that, that's the little insert, and that was designed to drop into the Gibson, uh, the existing Gibson um, brass space or whatever. Yeah, but it was still brass, wasn't it? So that you you just drop this this uh, uh, insert into there, and it would take the place of the notchy thing. It, interestingly, it would all, also put it back to being a, a slotted um, nut, which of course they they'd gone away from by using the zero fret so you reverted and the, the, the funny thing about it is is that some people will insist that the reason Gibson's or one of the reasons why Gibson's historically might not have stayed in tune is because or been difficult to keep in tune is because of the way the strings spread out and change direction going through the nut and actually if you find as I do using these um, actually these because they're tusk made with PTFE compounds so they're friction free um, the Gibson or well, the string doesn't mind that that spreads the changes direction uh, it copes with it perfectly well you don't need a string butler or any of that um, excessive malarkey this alone will keep the strings in tune or in combination with the other half of the deal which is stretching all the slack out of your strings before you start playing um, so anyway having put these on all of my three aside guitars and increasingly um, more customer guitars um, it seems to be pretty standard now because even though it looks a little bit non-standard when it's in place um, there's a gap at the end when it's standing up on its stilts um, the fact there has two distinct advantages the first one is um, because you raise the strings up to the first fret action you want instead of cutting down you retain the uh, unmolested smooth factory slots which you don't if you're using however good your um, slot cutting technique is you're going to rough up those slots so this approach keeps the slots unmolested and it allows you to bring them up to whatever you want of course that also allows you to alter that height at a later day so it gives you the benefit of tusk but also the un untouched slots which is a brilliant um, addition and I, I've put it on all my three three tuners aside guitars and I wouldn't do anything else now um, and they are in tune when I reach for them and I play them unless there's some other, unless I haven't stretched the strings. But you know, given the, if I stretch the strings and I've got the adjustable tusk nut, um, I'm in happy heaven because it never goes out of tune. So for me, this is, um, here we have this lovely old beastie on the bench. Um, with, all, with any guitar like this, my kind of radar is up. So the first point, my radar is kind of flagging up or the blip on my radar is just to check with my customer that this isn't too extreme. Now of course if he wants to sell this guitar in future he can revert to a standard nut or a or a even a standard 
let's pull tusk nut like this um, and that can go back in there and become a perfectly good um, playing standard looking instrument uh, and you can even you know finish uh, put some finish over the end some poly actually you can put poly over nitro it's no problem poly is easier to work with in this small quantities but you could just put some poly over the end of that and, and, and blend it in again um, so it's, it's revertible but I think that if as long as he keeps the guitar and plays it um, this will this will give good service but I, as I said I check with my customer that they you know they, they were fully aware that it changes the look of the guitar and that if they went to sell it on immediately for an, for a, a traditionalist it may be oh I don't like that what have you done it's non-standard so you know, I don't want to go ahead and do this with, with somebody um, not being aware of that. So that's the first thing I check. Um, and the other thing with any with any setup, I look at what I'm asked to do. Um, I'm asked to make the guitar play as well as it can, and I discuss what somebody's playing style is. Um, you know, are they big strummers? Are they uh, bluesy players? Do they hit the strings hard? Is there a lot of movement of the strings, or are they light players? Um, and I kind of assess at that point what the scale of the adjustment might be. Um, if somebody sent me a guitar that's really high action and I know I can drop it by a millimetre here um, and it's got a real huge curve and the relief on the neck and I know I can flatten that out, the, the combination of those two changes alone are, make a huge transformation to how the guitar feels to the owner. They're not great big changes in terms of millimetres, but they are massive perceptual or changes in the way the guitar feels and so and I just you know I think it was wise to be conscious of that because if you give somebody back a guitar that they're eager to have in their head you know what the lowest action I want it to be you know tusk not this that, and the other you give it back to them and it no longer feels like their guitar actually that doesn't do me or them particularly any good so I have to be conscious about if what if it's starting to line up to look like a major change in the way it feels and if it is, then I have to say to somebody, you know, this will be a significant change in experience of playing this guitar. Um, in this case, it's not going to be that. I think this guitar is, um, I have to say, I think it's pretty close to its optimum or minimum playing action uh, in, in all directions. Um, and I think the only real improvements I would aim to make with it would be to clear up what I noticed the other night would be some buzzing up here. And then somewhere. Right, some, some choking out. So, so there are small improvements we can make on this, and that's really the nice part about it is we're not going to do anything radical to it, um, apart from the nut, but we're going to, in terms of the leveling, where the aim would be to free up some of these buzzes and to make sure these, these notes um, play out. And I, I think up here I, yeah, there you go, choke outs completely. Now, at the moment, it looks pretty low, and what I don't know is what it comes up on when I put the, uh, the measurement what do you want to call it on it? So what I'll do is while we're here, see it from both sides. Hello. I'm going to put, um, I'm going to put a relief. See what that is. I'm going to go uh, first fret action. Um, it's going to be on the E, B, G, D, E, E. Then uh, high E, last fret, low E. Last fret, okay, and just get a, a feel for it. I think it will be close, if not below, maybe even at or below some of my minimum. So let's start with the neck relief. Get my thing. Um, Alan made a Alan made a point on um, on uh, Facebook earlier on. I showed a picture of the, the twinkling lights over here. I think Alan was nervous about tools on the wall. Um, I just want you to kind of see that. The guitar stops here, okay, then the tools that are on the wall are out of reach of the guitar in terms of distance, so then they drop off, they'll land over there to the right. And same as up here, if anything drops off here or slips off, which it won't because it's magnetic, but if anything came off while I was picking something up, it's well out of reach of the guitar. There's absolutely nothing over here in line of the guitar that is um, possible for, for it to drop off. The only thing that could have done would have been 
the uh, camera fixture and that's actually screwed onto the whiteboard to exactly for that reason to make double and triple sure that it doesn't I wouldn't rely on a suction device there these over here again if they drop off they fall straight down to the ground um, if they were to drop off and occasionally there's guitars hanging up here while I'm working on them but not all the time um, but they're out of they're out of reach of anything falling because it goes behind them because they're out on hangers so just to just to reassure you Alan and anyone else um, it's one of the things that I uh, care about most because it's it's the most avoidable of all things that you just don't want to get caught out by you know doing some nice work for a valued customer and then for no good reason at all having a, a screwdriver or something fall off from a shelf and land and um, put a dent in their guitar which then you know you're obliged to put right however that's going to happen um, and it could be an enormous expense on something like this okay so we've got quite a lot of neck relief here um, so that's interesting um, particularly since we've got some choke outs going on on the on the bends here so there is a bit of work to do uh, I think this neck relief here could be as high as 0.7 or something extreme people measure it in different places I tend to sort of aim for about halfway no it's not that extreme what am I talking about let's try let's start with 0.4 It's a bit over 0.4. I would put that down at 0.5, very close to. So that's that's curvy. Um, by all, I think Gibson's own specs go something like. Uh, I think it said it does it in thousands, but it said last time I looked, it said something like 0.16 millimeters up to 0.38 or something. Quite quite a, a wide range. But three eight or I think three six might have been uh, is you know at the outside absolute outside limit, um, and this is beyond that. So it can be flattened out a bit, and we ought to we ought to do that. Um, I've got my little Gibson esque thing. If you don't have a Gibson uh, truss rod adjuster, you can get the right socket and put it in on the end of a screwdriver like this. Um, so that's that's kind of high. Let's have a look at the um, the first frets. Just as it said, I think they look. Fairly good actually. G is fairly a little bit high, so I reckon these are about 0.5 of a millimeter. I'm maybe a bit too something or other. Point, yeah, about 0.5 actually. 0.6. That's now what I'm going to do first of all. Is I'm going to get a bit of um, a bit of tape here, and I'm going to put this tape down. Now we have a, an oldish guitar here, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my best to remove. Some of the stickiness of this tape before I go near anything with it. I need it to, I want it to provide uh, a sort of cushioning services, but what I don't really want it to be doing is sticking massively stickily, right? Because I don't want to run the risk of any bits of finish coming up and off. Um, so if you, if you are talking on another video yesterday about certain fender strats made in the USA and maybe Mexico, I can't remember now. But around a certain time and a certain period on the production line, they seem to have had really non-adhering non finishes, very very light um, poly finishes that come off the minute you go anywhere near them with a piece of masking tape. Even, even the lightest, unstickiest stuff on earth, you can't stop it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave, lean over the, um, the strings. I'm going to start with the G. So I reckon that's about a 0.6, which is higher than it needs to be um, and again it's about 0.7 actually but it's, that's the highest so I'd go 0 0.6 0 0.5 I think 0 0.6 and 0 0.5 maybe 7 actually there's 0 0.5 there's 0.5 we know that one yeah so I'd say I'd say uh, 0 0.5 0 0.5 0.65, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So that's just um, just a general sort of snapshot that says they're higher than needs needs be. Um, now, of course, if you were going to make an adjustment to that right now, you'd take that down with the nut slots. Um, but we're not going to do that. We're going to look to bring up the 
action to where we want it using the adjustable nut. Okay, now we go down the far end and we just have a look a dusty end, as they say. We'll have a look. Now this looks pretty low down here, so so you know this could be um, this could be a challenge, right, to make things play without chokes. We've got about point one point one millimeter on the low E. That's low, right? That's okay. And I say, well, that's low. That's fine. And then we go to the high E, and we see the high E is saying that is one point. That's 1.4, so it's a little higher than the base, which is unusual. Okay, so we've got a kind of reverse situation. I would kind of aim, normally aim for, a, if it was 1.4 there, 1.1 there, that would be pushing it a little bit. Um, okay, so that's interesting. Um, now, what we've also got to keep in mind is the condition of the frets. And I think what I'll do is I'll give you a close up with this thing here if I can get it off without switching anything off because that would be handy. Hey. Okay, I'm going to try and get a, a bit of a close-up. So if we're going to do anything, what are the frets like? What are they doing? What condition are they in? What can we tell about them? Is there anything that we can see that will make it possible or impossible? Well, as a setter-upper, the first thing we're going to need, you can see already, by the way, I'm not very good at finishing sentences, but you can see already just by the, the sort of shadows of the light, um, you can see already that the the low E um, gap is, is a bit smaller than the A, right? So I don't know if that's a worn saddle or something, but the or the, the radius of this being slightly different than the fingerboard, that's quite common. Um, but it means that um, we may have a situation where uh, if I'm just going to go back and measure in a minute, we may find that the G and the, sorry, the D and the A may be coming in at about 1.45 like we'd want, and it may be a saddle issue that's causing this uh, E to be a little lower. And that's a challenge you've got with these bridges. They are not the most accurate things in the world, and if, they, if the notches wear down, you end up with a, a weird situation. Now, you might have spotted, looking closely again at these frets before we do anything, may have spotted that these look quite flattened. Okay, so somebody is, I would say somebody has, I mean, it's been played a lot, um, and somebody may have leveled these in the past. I mean, I have to say for the action that it's currently set at, um, this plays pretty well. Um, you couldn't expect a guitar to play much better than this at one millimeter on the last fret low E and Sorry, 1.4. Yeah, uh, you might want, you might expect the 1.4, the high E, to not choke out as it does. Um, but they're not bad. Uh, but they've, they've clearly been, I would say, they've been worked on before. Hence the overall levelness. Now that becomes a challenge, okay? Because there, are, you know, then you have to say to yourself, okay, can I work with this? Well, actually, they they are pretty, um, they're pretty tall still. It may be that the person who's worked on this has gone deliberately for the flattened, I don't know what they call them, sleepers or train sleepers. There's a sort of a style with Gibsons that people like to have very flat, uh, wide, flat um, frets. And I've seen people argue, seen people argue endlessly about these things in forums. And it may well be a, style, a stylistic thing that Gibson fans really like, but there really is a problem from um, from just the mechanics side of it, right? And demonstrate it. Sorry about this. Um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll still be on close up. So if you think about a fret in its normal shape, and they they come they're either you know dome shaped or they might be a bit pointier or a bit more diamond shaped or whatever. But basically speaking, they are a um, they are a D shaped thing or an arch shaped thing. However, you get these old Gibsons that sort of look like this. Okay, by comparison. Now, you know, I can't imagine, I can't really see why, how intelligent people argue for that being a great thing in the Gibson Forum, because the point about this is that the string, it's designed to sit in the highest point of the fret, all right? And that then measures a certain distance from there down to the apex of the saddle, okay? 
and that distance x, shall we call it, is um, mathematically the right distance to play whatever note that is there. Let's call it a G, for example. Um, problem with this is if we look at the, the flattened version, highly amplified, what happens is the string might sit... Um, how, do we, how do we do this? No, it's not the other way around. It, let me just get my... The string doesn't sit like that, does it? It sits like this, right, at the top. But the distance is still the contact point through to the nut, okay? You got that? Yes. This one, the string sits across there too, right? But the contact point, in this case, reads from the highest, last highest point through to the nut, uh, to the, sorry, to the saddle, okay? And you can see it's X minus, call it A, for example. And if we make this distance A, the distance between the center point of the fret along its flat surface to the front edge facing the uh, saddle. Okay, so you, you can just see from that without being too mathematic because I'm not. You can see though it's a shorter distance and that clearly has an impact and an implication for the intonation. Okie dokie. Now obviously it's not a huge distance and we're not talking find a way of getting this back on here without shutting the video off. We aren't talking um, tons of miles of, you know, big chunks of millimetres. We're talking very small amount. But to be a purist about it, it's enough to potentially throw it off. So I, I'm, I, apart from somebody having a stubborn stylistic preference um, and not caring about the intonation, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, you could say, well, can't you can't you compensate for that um, with the saddles? And the truth is, no, you can't because what you're doing is you're changing the position, you're changing the, all the points along here. Um, so just making an extra long distance won't um, won't divide up the neck. You'd have to re-divide your neck up to counter this or to cope with this longer distance. And effectively, um, you you're, you I think you're. That's the thing. You're, yeah, you, if you fed in your new shorter scale length for each note, or your, no, it's not explaining it very well. But you'd get a you'd get a slightly different positioning of all of these um, points, and basically it moves everything away from the nut by a fraction, and that's not a good thing. It means your the very first note you play will be slightly out of tune because every, so will every note afterwards because everything is pushed that way towards the nut by a small amount. Um, anyway, um, so so that's a that's a question we got here. Is that if I'm going to um, do any leveling to this, then I'm going to have to be prepared to round off these frets again, um, which actually might be a fair bit of work involved in here because um, they are quite flat, and that means they're, they're jumbo frets without a doubt, but they are quite flat, and it means that I've got to get the recrowning tool. It's got a it's got to work on the um, on the flattened or the edges of the flat spot, and it's got to kind of cut them inwards um, to round off to make a new D shape or an arch shape out of that flattened fret. Um, now the thing is, we could we could pick one and just do it anyway without doing any leveling to it because that's actually um, it won't make any difference to the fret. So let's just out of interest see how much of a challenge this will be. Now I'm doing this out of sequence because without doing anything to the action or the uh, or the relief because I'm just looking to ascertain um, what the challenge is going to be like with uh, these flat frets. Now if I put a marker pen, put some marker pen on here right now and let's pick one that looks pretty damn flat. How about this one? The uh, 11th. Okay now if I paint marker pen on this and I work it over with the um, crowning tool. All I'm doing, if anything, is taking the edges off the flat plateau toward, in towards the middle. And as long as I leave a, a line of black marker pen down the centre, then I haven't adjusted the height anyway. So it wouldn't make any difference to the um, to the playability of this guitar. But this, this will tell me right away what scale of work there is to do. And I'm just going to gently work this for a little while and just see. Yeah, that's 
that's a lot of that's a very flat fret and as they all are um, possibly a better way to do this might be a manual file or a handheld handheld not a not a stumac thingy but we still have the same job to do we've got to kind of curve over um, curve over the flat edges um, and basically we're cutting away material from the edges the flat the, the fret overall stays the same width but the the what the width is all now at the base and the we've cook, we've curved it in to a, to the um, plateau at the top or the thinner narrower plateau um, the problem with this is if I don't recrown these file these files these frets um, I, I I can't it's not good enough for me to level them to try and clear out these these little buzzes and, and the chokes on the bends um, it's not good enough for me to do that without re-crowning this because I've le I'm leaving it with the intonation uh, incorrect now while I've got the strings undone we had um, what do we have we had the high E was too um, too high so I'm going to dial that down a bit and I'm going to dial out the low E and we'll measure it again in a minute just it makes it easier while the, um, the tension's off so I've got a sense of uh, work involved in this um, the, the issue might be if I carried on doing this um, and you sort of lean lean into it lean into it with the tool and see how easy it is to, to reduce that black line down the middle it's not impossible um, and even if we just do it a little or half the amount that was there before we've improved it um, because it's, it's, so it's basically the other thing of course is, I mean a bit, bit I didn't mention is if you have a flat spot you don't actually get a note at all. You don't get a clear note at all because um, put, pressing a string down onto a flat plateau um, beds the it, it touches the string down, you know, in a chunk, a flat chunk, and there's no apex for the string to form its note from. It will form a note, but the flatter it is, the more deadened the note will probably be. So the idea of having a, a, a apex to the fret is to give the fret a chance of making, forming a clear note. Now, that's a, that's a fair bit of time spent even on just one fret. We haven't done any leveling yet. Um, but that's just showing how much is involved, how much will be involved in trying to bring this to any, any sort of semblance of a point. Um, and this has, been, this has been flattened right to the edge because I can see now that it's forming a little apex on the edge where I'm taking a bit here and a bit there, but the flattened edge is still looking at me. Like I said, let me just have a quick look for the other tool, which lives down here. This is, a, this is not the file that I started out with. It's my, it's a bit dirty actually, but it's my um, three-sided uh, crowning file. It's got a safe edge here which is great for um, it, it doesn't do any damage to the uh, to the fingerboard. Uh, this is actually probably better for rounding off the fret a bit more than the Stumac file did. Um, this will take, this will really reshape it. The Stumac file sort of sits, uh, tries to sit on top um, whereas this allows me to start from vertical, turn it over and uh, kind of lean it in towards the center part of the fret. And in doing so, um, I probably, with this tool, I probably get the better result actually. Um, yeah, so I might actually end up doing this one by hand. I mean, that's by hand too, you know, but you know what I'm getting at. Um, but just for, for my confidence that I can reshape these. Now, having when I've done that, that's still a pretty chunky fret. So I think the disservice that's been done to this is a set of really jumbo frets has either been worn flat without being treated or recrowned, or has been fret leveled flat sometime in the past without being treated and recrowned. And the result is we have got this very, probably very comfortable feeling flat frets, but ones that won't be very massively accurate on forming notes. 
and maybe slightly out of tune because of the intonation issues that it causes. So I'm going to I'm going to sort of make the decision it's going to be this fret, uh, this file, and that I can once I've done more leveling, I actually can get to a thin line on the top of the um, top of the frets, so it will work for what I'm intending it to do. Now uh, the next challenge, um, well we we know what we're dealing with, we've had to think about the frets. One of the other constraints, so the two principal constraints to working on the guitar for a decent setup, certainly one that involves any fret leveling, is whether or not the um, truss rod works, um, because in the case of this one it's, it's too, uh, it's got too much relief and we want to adjust it out. Um, so the truss rod has to work, so you need to check this out. By the way, there's a split here in the Gibson truss rod cover, just to warn you in advance, and that's uh, that's in existence. So we just have to be very careful that when we put it back on, it doesn't snap off completely. I'll show you in close-up. It's very common. They always go right there. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, there you are. If you can see it, there's a little split. I fixed those in the past with a little tiny piece of tin, something resined in place, but it's quite, I might, I might do it if I get a, a moment or two. It'll just keep it from the next time you do it up, it will snap off and it will disappear and on the floor. So in here we got the familiar, it's a genuine Gibson um, truss rod adjuster. Where are, oh, there you are camera. Yeah, the, um, what do they call it? I called it something the other day, I forgot now. Um, the familiar truss rod adjuster. What was the guitar the other day had the truss rod went in the opposite direction? Oh, it was um, Marcus's Indonesian-made, Korean-made, no, Far Eastern-made um, Telecaster thing. And my God, it was bizarre. It actually adjusted the opposite direction. Okay, now I've done a, a tweak to that and I don't know what that's going to do. Um, because I've done it with the strings off. So the first thing I'm going to do is, while the strings are off, I'm going to just do the things I can do, like mark up the frets. And this will be ready for doing some fret leveling. And I'm going to use the Stumac U-channel fret file, or banana I call it, for this. I'm going to go over the one I've just crowned again, because I'm going to need to recrown it anyway. Um, and yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to mark these up first and then I'm going to look at the process of removing this nut. And um it's going to it's going to be scary because it's going to involve breaking the finish. So I'm going to wash my hands put my nightly my one hot water bucket per shift. And I don't mind that I don't have running water right inside here because it's only down the hallway in the kitchen room, which I haven't yet turned into any anything as in, in my studio workshop. Um, but I will do. Okay, so I have to be brave. We have to take, I'm going to get a new blade for this. And I'm going to wipe the new blade because they're always slightly oily. And... I might even get my freshly hung up grandpa glasses out so that I can look up close to be very clear what I'm doing. Now, I'm afraid you're not going to see this in the close-up department. Yeah, it's been nicely finished over and I can see that it, it goes just below the, the paint here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tie back these strings with a bit more uh, tape, but I'm, again, I'm going to do my best to take most of the stick out of the tape, except for where I want it to grip on itself. So like that, and then I'm going to sort of pull it round, stick it on there like that. And it just gets it out of the way. When you're there. Again, you won't be able to see too much. And then I'm going to get this to where I'm happy, and I'm going to look at using my thumb to describe a very small line and it it's causing the finish to come off over the nut which is just how it has to be I'm afraid and then we'll try and gently 
a scribe down the other side of the nut and I'm sort of doing it as gently as I can and letting it go that way if I can uh, just to prevent it from as much as possible from flaking at, uh, which is you never completely get away with it like that done a little bit of a flake there not breathing so of course one of the reasons for doing that is I want to be able to get this nut out without pulling a load of finish out unexpectedly. I know it's going to take a little bit of that finish out. And I'm going to do the same on this side and I'll need a, a bit of a pull over here. Um, which I probably made it slightly difficult to do. Doing. Yeah, so it's always, always a scary thing to just cross these over the opposite directions. You go there, and you go there. Done. Just about. Yes, so breaking, breaking finish seals is a, is a scary thing any time of day. So there's a little bit of painted finish that's gone over here that I think may have been hand painted to cover up the nut. And my technique with the blade is actually there's no specific technique. It's whatever works to um, control it. And I tend to find having the blade under tension one way or another um, gives me much better control than if it's just sort of flopping about free so I like to kind of keep a uh, attention on it okay now now this um, I've no idea at this point how much glue is or isn't involved in this nut um, and that's something I'm not going to know until uh, I've been able to tap it a little bit and have a kind of look now I can also feel there's finish cracking off the nut down here, so it's run. The finish has kind of run down over the paintwork and over the nut, so it suggests that this was the nut that was installed uh, in the factory, which wouldn't surprise me at all. So I'm now just putting a little bit of um, a little bit of a blade down the edge there to just mainly to break the seal of, of any finish that's running up the side of the nut because I, I want I don't mind that breaking but I don't want the stuff this side of the nut to break okay so at this point in time um, it's not really going to do anything it's, it's, if it's glued in it certainly isn't going to do anything um, it could be that a very light tap now with something could um, like that, could help um, what you would call it free up the glue um, and it could be, sometimes you can use like a rubber thing. Um, so I just want to support it. So now I'm just going to give it a little sort of tap and see if there is any glue. And that's very snug, so nothing immediately happening there. Um, there's no, there's no finish down in this corner. Um, Let's just check there isn't. I'm saying that, but it might just be a little bit here. It's been cut or filled in that corner to tidy it up. But okay, so that's not moving anywhere. So if that's glued solidly all the way along, then that that's going to make it harder, and I'll have to cut this whole nut down the middle, um, which again is isn't hard isn't that hard to do. Um, we would take thing like this and probably choose whichever thing we think would cut that nut the best um, and I think actually the hacksaw is probably the best device for now and obviously it's not it's a slope so just have to be a little bit careful to make sure we get a bite
straight line down there. Um, it's quite a deep nut, so it's quite a while to go. So let's continue with, with patience. this is not going down below the edge of the nut or below the um, depth of the nut it's actually quite quite difficult to get it precisely you could do this with the Dremel but that's a bit less controllable um, the hacksaw in the nut at least you know what it's doing um, do in cutting the nut is you you eventually create um, a gap which means you can fold the parts of the nut in on each other I don't know what you can see there it's not the oh, wrong end of everything sorry um, yeah we'll, we'll we'll stick on this camera view sorry about that um, now I can see this is now reaching the um, it's reaching the pre some of the pre-drilled holes in the nut <laughs> This is interesting because the um, the slot in this is actually um, much more like uh, a strat in a way than uh, than the Les Paul typical Les Paul copy style uh, slot. So the nut here has to slot into it, whereas usually it's a, a right angled L shaped corner. Um, so what we can do at this point, if we want to, we can um, we can just break off the top part of the nut if we wish to get it out of the way. That just sort of shows us where we are. Um, gives us an indication too whether there's any glue. But I don't think there's any glue on the facing edge, which is cool. And then it's just a matter of very careful uh, continued sawing. And again, we can tap from the other side when we're when we're getting close to the end. Just double check over there. side now. Not really. I could use a rubber hammer better. Have I got one? Yes. In fact, I could probably use something else. This little thing better as well. stuff but it's not necessarily that good for free running non friction strings so I'm just watching to make sure I know exactly when we reach near the bottom of the slot
have a feeling that that could be glued in quite well, but it's okay. We'll get there. I'll get close to the edge. Okay, it's almost there. So we want to, we do want to see this snap off, please. Thank you. And that's quite good because it's a uh, Out it comes completely. Mm. Very chalky bone. Chalky bone. Okay, so I think we've got probably a fair bit of glue along the bottom part of this, so we shall be prepared for it. it might be quite a, a bit more of a dig out. It might take take might take quite some time. Um, well, you can. We can go in a bit with with some small screwdrivers, flat bits. There's one. There's another one. Uh, and there's another one. So this might just be a very long, drawn-out bit of chipping away business. So we'll get there eventually, just uh, slowly, with great care, so we don't make any marks in the in the faces of the slot. This is going to take a while. I'm going to stop and come back to you when it's done. All right. Again. Ready, ready. Second filming bit. Okay. Um, I've got. It's interesting on this one because this is a very thin slot compared to normal adjustable tusk nuts. But there's absolutely no problem with that. I'm just making very carefully making a thinner and thinner by degrees nut until it fits in the slot all the way down to the bottom. Now it's in the slot, but I, I don't want to whack it home. I want it to fit just a little bit easier than that. So I'm just um, very lightly flattening it a bit more, very cautiously. I want it to go in, I want it to be snug, but I don't want it to be jammed in so I can't get it out because I would be happy to secure it with a little bit of glue at the bottom of the slot. Now before and the other reason it's got to come out again because I absolutely need to be able to um, cut it down to size which I can't do just yet so I'm just checking uh, it gets thicker a little bit thicker as it goes up so I'm just going to carry on take a little bit off here off this edge and when I say edge, I just mean I'm putting a little bit more pressure on one part than the other to kind of uneven the take the removal. Look at that, it's starting to go in really nicely. Obviously, I'm going to want it to sit right down on the ground, right down on the ground um, when it's sat in there. And then we'll stop, prevent final movement with a little dab of glue. But right now, it's just getting right down to flush with the flush. There you go, it's flush. Now, the problem right now is now this is too tall, so I've got a bit of work to do now to get it down to the right height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the string constraints for a minute. Um, and we will use the strings in a minute as our assistants. <laughs> okay. So I've, I've made a careful check of the slot to make sure there's no glue getting in the way, stopping it seating smoothly. Um, and it's just a matter of getting the thickness down to uh, just the right thickness. And it's, as you can probably tell now, it's, we're, we're down to individual strokes of the sandpaper before we get too much or too little. That's almost on the, 
on the mark there. So you can see that fits in beautifully, all right? And actually it looks really good, but we're too tall. And I'll tell you how I know we're too tall, because if I put the strings back on there, at rest, I want the strings touching on the fret before we do any raising of the nut. So that's my target point. Um, and actually, I could probably tell you right now, if I was just looking, this seats right beautifully smoothly in the in the slot. So if I were to look at this now, I could probably gauge the gap here. Um, metric 40, 70, 95, uh, 110, 130. 130, one millimeter, three, that's too much, okay. Um, what's this, uh, uh, 70, 95, 110, 110. Okay, about 110, one millimeter, 10, too tall. Okay, so if I really want to, I can get hold of my micrometer, my digital vernier. And I can dial in 110 on here from the bottom upwards. Mark it off there. Get a fine, fine pen of some sort. That'll do. Might not be very fine. I'm kind of running out of fine pens, but I can just line it up here and make a mark. This isn't. This isn't massively precisely accurate but it's enough good enough to just help me mark off a gross amount yep that looks about right so it's just a useful guide i can see i can see what i'm looking for right um, so now i'm going to need to take that down manually but retain a flat base and that's that's going to be challenging so we're just going to work it down a bit and then stop and look at the condition of the um, you know the angle at the bottom and I want it to be exactly in line with not the top of the nut but in line with the little line on the underside so I just have to kind of get a sense of whether I'm going off in one direction or the other and if I am and then I sort of lean in a counter direction and I have to get it right before I run out of material um, which is the only constraint so it's a it's an interesting little challenge to get right and I as you can see probably I'm tend to when I get the level flat that I want I tend to move my body more than the piece of more than my hands because I want to keep the same angle which is pretty good at the moment um, so if I can keep the same angle and just move my whole self I can take it down at a sort of predictable rate and still got the nice angle that I want. Um, a little bit more weight on this side, the right hand side. Um, and that's just a matter of slightly easing the pressure on one side and increasing it on the other and letting it sort of catch up the difference. It's, it's a kind of a thing you have to have some practice in. And then you can cross over to the finer stuff and just concentrate on smoothing it off so I don't want it to move smoothing it off when you've got pretty much the height you want now I can check now whether I'm close to the point I want to get to um, looking good I mean it's looking too high still but yep yeah, even when this is fully tightened up that won't sit quite down. So we're a, we're a little more to go. And again, we can gauge how much if we need to. The, the, the great thing is, is we can go a little extra over. It won't be the end of the world because we can just raise the nut a little bit higher um, when it's seated in place. So it's better to go over than to stop too short. Okay, that's the rule of thumb. And you're always just checking for that angle to be right before you finish sanding. So it's very, very precise. That was why I call it my custom adjustable because there is a lot of precision sanding and shaping to make this thing fit for this guitar and this guitar only. 
we are almost flat on the on the uh, thingy <laughs> fret. Now it might make sense to continue on with just that one, but I will move it along nicely with a couple more full-sized scrapes on here. Again, always checking for that squareness of the base so we got that right. And then once we have, it's feeling a little bit of rocking going on there, something caught underneath, a little bit sticking up. Um, we've got the angle just about right, so I'm just going to um, let that smooth itself out without too much force. Looking good. So each time you've got to make sure it's seated right down in against the wood. That, my dears, should be about right. Actually, that one's slightly different, but we put them under tension. And this will help to put the nut, squeeze the nut into place. <laughs> Could be that I've now got no choice about it. It's practically how I want it. That's as low as I need it to be. Everything from there on is going to be upwards. And we can still pull it out, which is great. I'm going to give it a little bit more, just that tiny bit more. That's it. Step back, step away from the nut. Change glasses. Take away sharp sawing thing. Um, yes, so courage is required for the removal of such things as um, bone, well glued in bone nuts. Um, and for those of you watching, I probably get loads of people going, I wouldn't let you near my nut, my bone nut with a something other or other. And I say, well, I made sure it worked and everything's fitted just perfectly. There we are. Now I could glue that in later. I think that's what I'll do because now all I want, all I want to do is um, load it up, get the strings on, see them all sitting against pretty much the first fret. And then I'm going to raise up my action, check my neck relief, so get it up to tune, and then we'll, we'll see. Now, when you're using an adjustable nut, um, tune from the middle outwards. So the D and the G. Now, obviously, I'm not going to tune because that's now going to hit the fret, or pretty much close to it. So before we get any tuning, proper tuning done, we just put it under, under load. Okay, so they're not, they're almost touching, a couple of them are touching, um, and not all of them, but they're close. So all I want to do now is raise up a little bit to get clearance so I can get the tuning going uh, at either end. And there we go, there's our adjustable nut at work. Uh, get an E, A. Oh, I'm happy with that. That's a nice looking thing. What a perfect fit. Oh yeah. Now when it comes down, I might just take it out again and polish it because it's it's a fraction. It's got still got the 240 grit sandpaper marks on it, but that's fine. It's now in place. Now I did a, an adjustment on the truss rod and I did an, adjust, an, an adjustment on the bridge. So let's just see what that turned into in both instances. Just a quick eyeball. Right, truss rod's flattened out quite a bit. And the bridge is way lower. I thought I went up with this one. Did I? Did I not go up? I could use my I could use my handy little 
thing that's usually good for doing up the treble treble thingy switch but this one is quite good for that too what am i trying to do i'm trying to go counterclockwise maybe i went clockwise Beauties, counterclockwise, please. It's very small adjustments, but okay. We are on 1.1.2 now. Again, which a bit low, but it's not surprising that that's showing up at that height. Um, let's go to 1.5 and 1.2, which is my tried and tested low action. Because I think the thing with this is. Even if uh, Drew likes this really low, I think what he's going to find is the lowness here and the flatness of the neck is going to make a, for a much lower playing guitar, a lower feeling. Okay, uh, it's one point, I would say 1.25, nearly, nearly 1.5. Now if it's doing that, it's fine. We'll just take care of that with a slight raise on the nut. Because we're, we're not really at any set height there. I just I just lifted it enough to clear the decks, but we can we can go a little bit higher there and, and there and see what how it seats. Okay, one point four and barely one one point one. Give us an A. Where did my A go? There it is. Flat as a. Oh, <laughs> I'm scraping the uh, the not very nice thing. That's that's yeah, sticky sticky uh, mm, mark, mark pen. Um, so the question is, are we getting some general buzzes? Well, that is still a little bit low, so I'm not going to play. Let's push it to its ridiculous extremes. Let's go to where I normally go. Okay, let's not let's not be crazy. And this one is, needs to be counterclockwise as well. and 1.5 okay right well I'm not gonna um, wire off all this black stuff again I'm going to now proclaim it's time to gently level <laughs> using the levelometer using oh I tell you what I'm gonna do before I do anything else Oh, actually what I was going to do is I'm going to take a tiny bit of that, uh, add a tiny bit more relief. That's a little bit flat for my liking. It's only a tiny bit. But I'm going to put this down on the stool for a second. Because I'm going to be doing stuff with 
a lot of dust or a lot of mucky fret dust or a mixture of marker pen and fret dust. I'm just going to put this layer of sorry layer of stuff here. It gives me a chance of keeping the carpet a little bit clean all the time. Maybe I don't know what you can see there. Okay, yeah, the neck really fret leveling. Um, right. So we've got the nut right. We've got the neck relief probably right when I just check it in a second. And we'll get our um, our things ready for leveling. Now what's going to happen straight away, it's just opened up a bit again. I'm going to go just a fraction, half away now, half a turn the other way. Um, what, what will happen, the thing that happens with um, okay, I have now lost the thing. The thing that happens when you've when you've got frets that have already been leveled quite flat, um, and you go with your fret leveling device, the thing that happens is you. It seems quite a. You get as soon as you go over the frets, you suddenly they show up like a big flat spot, like you as if you've leveled a ton. Uh, of material which you haven't because the, the point being is it was already flat and if you remember that's our kind of challenge with this is to work with already fairly flat frets fairly flat frets that's my new business um, the neck is sitting pretty flat so I'm gonna dial this one out to flat if it doesn't go all the way flat or where we need to I'll change it now that's just right uh, that rod doesn't go to completely flat but we aren't completely flat on this anyway Right, so here we go, and so this is going to show us. Um, I'll show you in a close-up, but and some of the pay of the marker pens come off. So I go over this now with my Stumac leveling tool, and the, 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 the interesting thing that's going to happen is I'm going to see the marker pen come off very quickly into a sort of, oh my God, you've leveled these things to death and back. Actually, that's not me, it's previous leveling. But what it's showing me is interesting. We've got a little cutting here. We've got nothing happening there. So we've got, we've got a low spot here. We're cutting there, we're cutting up to there, and then we've got a low spot here and it's cutting on the end. So we've got an undulation on this neck, without a doubt. And that's possibly, or it's an undulation in the, the frets. And that could be partly why this, this is a difficult one to level. Who knows, maybe somebody's leveled certain areas and not the others. Maybe it hasn't been really leveled at all. Maybe it's just worn with play wear. But we've got a couple of low spots here and the low spots make the next ones high. So I'm just gonna give it a little bit more work with this and just kind of see where we get to. Again, it looks extreme because of the flatness of the frets from before. <laughs> but there's barely any dust kicking up compared to other guitars I've leveled. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop there and I'm just gonna play the notes. And what I want is for a nice low action. Fine, I, all the notes play cleanly. What I'm gonna be concerned about is making sure that as we come across towards what I call the G track, where the G string sits, is I'm gonna make sure that our bends get to that because it's usually, when, when you get choke outs in the high E bends, it's, uh, it's choking out on slight high fret or unevenness in the G track. Um, and that, it's a, it's a, it's a combination, combination of high fret and the natural limitations of the radius, the geometry of the radius. So we I can still see a flat spot just up here on the end but it's not too bad now it's it's evening out again it's not there's not a lot of material being moved okay we're well now we're getting the choke out in the G track so this next one is the critical one to whether this is going to turn out the way I want. Um, and this is the leveling of the G track. 
again, if, you've, if you're doing this for the first time and you weren't experienced in it, you would be terrified at the look of the tops of those frets. It looks as if you'd think, you might think that um, you'd scraped half of the fret life off the frets. Well, we haven't, as, as you've seen from the beginning, that material is already gone. It's, uh, it's either played away or it's leveled away. So this is, the, this is the, the sort of challenge now. We know that we've got a choke out or two on the G track. And what I'm hoping now is this process of leveling in the G track is gonna fix that so that we recover these bends without any choke. So as the E string comes across, it's playing okay on this. Now the next, as you know, the next part of this challenge will be re-crowning these frets. Not bad. Now we're, where are we here? We're across, almost into the D, so I think. Again, that's in the D track. I think we're gonna be there. That's almost there, but the last remaining bit is the D track, and I think we'll just take care of that now, and then we'll be concentrating on the outside edges of the low E to make sure that plays without any buzzing on the notes, um, and we'll be good. So some people think, some people want to think, like to think, that they're, you know, that certain guitars have um, a certain, that require certain special treatment. And while it's true that some guitars are, you know, exotic in terms of how they're made um, and so on, uh, the truth is that they are all still a neck, some frets, some strings. They're all essentially the same thing and whilst of course there are peculiarities and uh, you know interesting characteristics of all of them, um, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't take too seriously somebody who would insist that you can't work on a Gibson because you don't know Gibsons or that there is a special, you know, some people like to think there is a special set of uh, factory settings that you must put in, you know, dial in to, you know, if you're going to work on Gibson. The truth is you can dial in whatever you want. It, it's all about, um, did I just cut it off? Do, do that again in case I didn't, I've forgotten. Um, the, to me, the, the thing to remember is that the numbers that you might read in a forum or somebody absolutely assures you is the correct specs for Gibson, for example, um, those are really their start points to reach an end goal. And the end goal is a guitar that plays uh, well um, for most people. But of course, it's always dependent on preference anyway. So like, a, you know, you saw the huge range in the Gibson factory uh, relief recommendation. Well, it's a very, very wide range of settings. Um, and to be honest, it's down to what you prefer. So I would always say, nice. phone made a noise. I would always say um, treat the numbers as a start point but but experiment and find the settings that you like. Um, same with the, you know the idea of truss rods. People can be very afraid of adjusting the truss rods. Um, there's a common perception or often a perception or fear that you can damage your truss rod by adjusting it or you, you buy a Gibson and you take it home and it's, something doesn't quite work and you're not quite sure what the truss rod does and there's people are people on forums are telling you to adjust it and other people saying, oh, don't touch it, take it to a Gibson, blah, blah, blah. You know, you could break your, could snap your guitar's truss rod if you, it, you can't. I've, I've deliberately set out to try and break truss rods and unless it's already seized, halfway broken anyway. 
Oh wow, all done. Unless it's uh, pretty much broken anyway, you can't damage it. It's very impossible, very impossible. It's very hard to damage it. So I take ignore all of that scare mongering stuff about truss rods. It's designed to be cranked in one direction or the other, all directions. So I would say dial it one way. It'll go for what Gibson says if you can find it and start with that, see what it feels like. And then dial it hard the other way. So if you've, if you've set it with 0.2, dial it hard the other way until it flattens out completely, or even goes the other way, goes back bowed, and see what that does. Feel for yourself the differences it makes. If you go back bowed, you'll notice that it stops you playing notes down here. They, they choke out just, just trying to play them, fret them. Um, go the opposite way. If you start with two, come back from back bowed and go the opposite way and put in 0.6 or put a millimeter of um, relief in, right? See how that strikes you. Uh, and see what it does to the action and where the action feels higher. And, and try and you know get a sense of how much difference, how big is the difference that making a truss rod adjustment makes compared to adjusting the bridge action or the last fret action as I call it. You know, see which one makes the bigger difference. Which one, which one can you afford to adjust without changing the feel of the guitar versus which one um, which one can't you know which one can't you adjust because it changes the guitar significantly in a way that you might not want so for you you know it's much better for you to to develop a, a working understanding of it for yourself rather than take any word from people like me or anyone else actually for that matter right i'm going to remove the bridge for a minute just stand it off to there and we're going to i'm going to do the well my hands are still dirty i'm going to do the uh I'm going to start doing the um, crowning, but what you'll see is I will stop and come back when it's done because it will take me some time. But I'll show you the start bit and just see kind of how slow it takes. Now, the tool has a soft edge um, designed for allowing you to run it over wood um, without doing any damage. So um, this won't scratch the fingerboard and it won't dig in. Okay. Like I say, we could use the Stumac concave offset diamond file but I have a feeling my instinct tells me this special beauty requires um, a, a different touch while I'm there by the way I'm going to take this out again because I want to make a tiny adjustment or smooth off polish off the edges and then next time I put it in I'll put a tiny dab of glue in there so that when it goes down under string loading it will, or when we put it in I'll push it down and it will be kind of planted in place so for this what I'm going to do is I start on the smooth edge okay and the smooth edge can run up and down this uh, ebony beautifully right and so I start with it start with it if that's the fret and the stuff right I start with it tipped away from the fret so it's not even hardly touching it and then I lean it into the fret to bite the edge of the fret and I keep going up and down and then I curl over towards the top of the fret and stop when I think I've reached the top of the fret so I'm cutting nothing and I'm sort of holding it in place just gently with this finger. And then as I lean over onto the fret, I can feel it, hear it, and feel it starting to cut the metal a little bit. And I'm leaning over and leaning over more. And I can sort of feel it cutting all the way down nicely and leaning over further. And then you can oh, jump across like that. Then you can stop start on the other side, lean away from it, run down the edge and sort of make contact until you can feel it biting. And then when it bites, start to lean over it into the fret and, and you'll see the, the cutting, the cut edge start to shine metal. And again, this finger in place seems to me to help it stop it from turning and flipping over quite so far all the way. Now, that for me is actually a better, I mean, I'm not even all the way there yet. It's, it's a better result than for me than um, using the Stumac file. I'm getting more, I'm getting closer into the top of that and getting a thinner line down the top of that fret. And, and this, this will tell me that for once, whoops, sometimes you, you get a little bit too far and then you kind of jump over the wrong side. But 
This will tell me that for once, these frets now are going to have the most reshaped shape they've ever had. Um, you know, up till now they've been flat, but this is uh, this is quite a quite a radical re-rounding, shall we say? Um, and I'm just kind of it gets to a point. There, it, there it reaches a point where you can't go any further without slipping over the top, and that when you when you're pretty sure you're there, you're sort of you're, you're at its peak point. You're sort of resting almost on the top of the fret, and there's not a lot stopping you hand slipping over, but that is very, very close, and that's a much better um, shape. In fact, I'll show you the close-up now, and then we'll switch this off. Oh my God. And then we'll stop this recording altogether, actually. Um, I seem to have run out of stuff. Oh, for some reason, none of that was recording. Maybe it was, or maybe it's run out of memory. I don't know. This is a, the kind of profile we get on a hand, um, hand, uh, re-crowned. I couldn't get that. I don't think I could get that with the Stumac file because it's these frets were so flat that it has to have this sort of hand treatment to do quite a lot of carving. It's it's only reducing the flat edge, the flat bit, if you get what I mean. Um, you know, it, it's just taking away the excess edge. And I'm going to do all this by hand now. Sorry about this. You can see it on this camera. I haven't lost it. I just haven't recorded this bit on close up the way I thought I had. Oh. <laughs> yeah, if I had somebody doing it for me, it would be so much easier. Right. Anyway, so I'm going to stop now. I'm going to put the radio on. I'm going to go all the way down this. Then I'm going to stick the nut in place. Then I'm going to polish up the guitar, get rid of the dust. Then I'm going to put some uh, oil on the board to clean it or clean the board, then oil it, then put some new strings on. Oh, and what I have to do is I can't remember what the gauge of strings. Somebody just recently wanted eights, but I don't think. Maybe it was. Huh? Well, that's got to be a millimetre, and that's got to be an in inches, first of all. Was it uh, Drew that wanted? Ooh, you know what? I think it might be Drew. Huh? It might just be Drew. Have I got a set of eights? Yes, it is Drew. <gasps> I'm so sorry. Uh, I think I have got some eights in here. I knew I had some in the back of my mind. For God's sakes. Where are they? Goodness gracious, have they gone? Oh, blimey. I have to go hunting. I had eights. I had eights. I tell you, I had eights. I had eights. That's not eights. This is tens. Ah, the eights. There's some eights, but that's not the ones I was going to use. But we have eights, if necessary. But I had another set of only bought eights somewhere in a different container, sticking out of a different box. I will search for it offline. Anyway, I'm going off to do that. I'll see you in a bit. Back on, and we're at the finishing thingy leg of finishing leg last leg that's the one um, everything polished out recrowned uh, it's great to see these frets with actual crowns on them it's totally different um, I might get some close up close ups because yeah it's a completely different look to before um, they're actually fret shaped believe it or not Breathe. Right. Well, these are um, sealed strings. They're quite decent quality. Um, normally, I would do any any balls, but I can't find them in the in the move. I've missed a, a set or lost a set that have gone wandering. But hey. So meanwhile, we're going to use these, and it's better to. I want to put. I could put nines on, but. I'm going to put eights on because that's what they came with and it came with and obviously I want to have the same loading on the guitar when it goes back that it and it came with so if I just get these untangled <laughs> it's just a little bit more difficult than normal come on right, there's one here um, Come on, out you come. And you know, come out as well. Yes, so I'm pleased with the outcome of that. I'm very happy with the adjustable nut. That's all gone very well. And come on. It's a bit hard to get these untangled. 
Uh, yes, it's all, all gone lovely jubbly. This is an unusually difficult set of strings to untangle, I have to say. All very well being sealed and foiled, but it didn't make this bit very easy. Maybe I've just taken a dopey approach to it, I honestly don't know, but maybe there's two different sets or three sets of two that I've got tangled up in some ridiculous sort of fashion, but... <laughs> Anyway, in a minute, when I finally get through this stupidness, I will, we will, we, I, us, shall restring. Nearly there. Hurrah. Da, 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 da. Thank you. Blimey. Right, now, the uh, thing I am going to do here is I noticed that this is quite a steep angle on this. Uh, on the brake angle on these strings. I'm going to raise this up a bit because I don't think it needs to be that steep. It's not really. It just, it's just adds downward pressure uh, onto the watch I call it. Oh, see, I nearly, nearly did the wrong thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the strings on and I'm going to follow my own advice and I'm going to tighten up the middle ones first to make sure this adjustable nut doesn't go anywhere. Um, uh, Drew, for your info, the adjustable nut comes off at any time, if I can get my fingernails under it, uh, leaving the base slightly glued in place. And you can um, place this back in any time you want with the fat edge or the tall edge facing the bridge. Okay, that's the correct way around. The tall face, I should say, that's a better way of putting it, the tall face. Um, so, here we go, uh, we'll put this one on first to hold the hold the uh, nut in place and what I'll do is I'll line up all my tuna holes first, make the job a bit easier. So we're going on the D, D string first, ultra light D string, go to the end, you, I think you strung like this on your last one so you're, you're a fan of the same method as me. Pull back a fret, hold the held string over the loose string, and the second time round, pull up the loose string, and direct the held string under the loose string, which makes a sort of locking unit, holds it in place. Okay, right, that's the nut held in place. And then we can do G's, there's the, there now, which is which? Now, there's the G. Uh -huh. So what we'll do after this is we'll stretch out the strings because that's the second most important or the second 50% of the um, tuning stability equation. First one is first half of the deal is the nut and the slots which we've taken care of and the second part the other half is uh, these are quite stiff these tunes. The other half is um, uh, stretching the slack out of the strings. Now this is a set of eight so it's even easier for me to break the E string while stretching so I'm going to do my best not to um, but uh, what it means is practically speaking I may send this guitar back with a fraction more slack in its strings than I would do for a, maybe a nine or a ten certainly a ten set just because I can't, you know, I haven't got any more eights, so I, I really can't afford to break a string on this. Otherwise, we'll have to wait and get another set in days from now, which is not so good. So, after all of that, I'm pleased with how this worked out. Um, it's the first time, actually, I've... Actually, yeah, it is the first time I've put a adjustable nut on a Gibson Les Paul I think um, and it's also the first time I put one in such a uh, contained deep slot most copies have in just an L-shaped um, 
nut platform, nut step. Um, sounds like a Tina Turner song. Nut step city limits. Um, uh, this is this down. Are the E's all both? Which one's which? Come on. Which one's the thin one? Which one's the fat one? That's the fatter. That, oh my god, they're so similar. That's the B, the purple. Um, yeah, so first time I've done this on a Gibson and first time I've done it in a slot where I've had to basically cut down the um, nut thinner. But the great thing is, is you can do that. You can, as long as you go from both sides and keep it straight, make sure it stays uh, you know, perpendicular to the base of the nut and you know, it keeps its shape. And that's the hardest bit of doing these custom nuts. The, actually the base, making the base in resin isn't, is, is, is it, it's quite tricky and it's a little bit expensive. Um, the resin that I use is, is not cheap. It's, a, it's Plast Aid, which um, is the only resin I found that does, that does what I want. You know, it, it's strong enough and solid enough to do, to work as the base for my purposes, but I've tried various different things. Um, and it's, and it's moldable and it's controllable um, as and when I need to shape it. Um, and then it's, it's a matter of sanding it, working it very, very carefully um, to fit, as you saw a bit earlier on. Um, and of course, if you get that wrong, uh, you overcut and then you've got a loose, too loose a nut, too loose a nut. And it's uh, basically good for throwing away. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got to build up a, a degree of confidence in doing it so you're not going to waste money every time. Funny little, a couple little blemishes on the finish, like blisters. Um, Gibson. Good old Gibson. Right, so, so we just sort of make sure they're all stay where you are, make sure they're kind of on. And a little bit of a pull, obviously being eights, taking it easy. Okay, so we'll go for a tune off the A. So, we've got stretching to do, we've got intonation to do. Um, we've also got checking the, for the first fret action to do, which currently is a little bit high. And what I'm kind of interested in is the, the frets are actually a different radius to the nuts. So the frets on this are not actually at 12 inch. How about that? You'd never realize that, would you? They're actually slightly higher on the edges. Can you believe that? That's definitely, that's the way it is. So let me just do some stretching first and then we'll see where we are. I mean, this is the thing, I don't want to file it cut into the nut slots, that was the whole point of this. Um, but the, the problem is, if you're using, same with the bridge at the other end, that bridge is I don't think it's exactly a 12 inch radius. They're supposed to be, um, but I'm not even sure it is. Or if it is, it could be that this neck over the years has become not 12 inch radius. 
however much it started out at. So, we, you know, the, the downside of that is you can make it match, but obviously we have to kind of work both the nut and the saddle down to whatever the neck is. I mean, they're all pretty good except for, I mean, the, the two E's are a little bit higher than everything else because it's that's what I'm seeing is that this fingerboard appears to be rolled at the edges. I don't know if that's maybe, I don't know what, how, that, how it was made, but so it, the, the two E's are a little bit higher than everything else. Okay, so there we are at our ideal action. Like I say, really uh, a fraction, a fraction different on the a fraction higher on both the uh, on the E's. Actually, you know what? That's not true on the outside. E. I've, it's a little higher at this end. That's probably what it is. Let's just drop that down. Yeah, so actually of all of it, it, no it still is, it's a fraction up on, a tiny bit up on this one, about a tenth of a tenth, no, a hundredth of a mil, something ridiculous, but possibly the high E, the low E is a fraction, a smidgen higher than the other ones, but actually it's so little, I wouldn't worry. Right, going to give it one more thumb and forefinger stretch and then we'll do the intonation and then it'll be back in its box. I'm not going to paint over the end of this nut. It's, it'll be mixing finishes which is okay to do but it, it, won't, it won't really make much difference and to be honest it, if you ever wanted to change it back you don't have to break it all off again anyway. So I think functionally, looks wise, it's not bad looking as it comes. So I think I'm going to leave it like it is. Okay, tuna, tuna rope thing, black rope thing with wires in it, whatever that's called. Check the jack sockets nice and tight. Very good. And here we go. Now let's see, Gibson, let's see how far off you're going to be for me. Trust this would be right. 
I'm, I'm hoping, hoping, praying, hoping, praying, hoping, praying. Rest that in there like that. In there like that. Am I going the wrong way? <laughs> there we have it. That's it. Beautiful. It was intonated perfectly, so that's great. Job done. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, on a Saturday night, I have a bit more I was supposed to do tonight, but I'm happy that I've got progress on the scratch plates that I came up here to solder up. I'm also happy that um, I got this done, nut fitted, nut bush city limits. Uh, what I might do, the one little detail I might take care of, um, if I can find me a bit of tin. I, I think it's, I, I care enough, I care enough about this. I won't find the damn thing. I care enough about this to, uh, stop this breaking off. This is definitely going to snap off and glue on its own won't hold it. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my little, little job with a, with a tin, a very small bit of tin, which I can kind of sand and cut off. So it's pretty, pretty thin. It's tin. It's very tin. Um, I need my cutters, cutters, cutters. Uh, I've got some, um, the word I'm looking for is what is the word? What are the word I is looking for? Is I'm looking for the word of resin. Resin. I'm going to get some resin. And I am going to use the resin to stick the thing back together. Now I just put a little piece on here and that's all it's going to be. Just to stop those little pieces of plastic because when when you tighten that somebody one day is going to tighten that and it's going to ping off and that will be the end of it and it won't actually do up anymore because that will snapped off so what I'm trying to do is I make myself a little curvy bit of hellfire do what you're told make myself a little bit of that like that which then will go on there like that and then I will drill very carefully through and uh, under the neath. And that will then be a little holder, which will keep the plastic in one place. Um, so I have to just find where are my resins, mes resins. And that one is already open, jolly good. Getting it stuck to his fingers. Now, where, where is the, ah, it's here, the, the pursed it nerds. There we go, that's all the resin I need. Fast drying resin. Fuck, I'm gonna kick it off my fingers. And then I get my little throwaway matchstick device. Make me the stuff active. So the difficult bit is getting it to stick without it and becoming an absolute stinking mess. So I was about to do it that way up but of course the crack is on this end. <laughs> Silly bugger. So we don't mind if we get it round the top here. Okay. And that's there like that. Drop that on there like that. And then the trick, I suppose, 
is to flatten this down, get it to fit, take off as much of the excess as possible. And then somehow we're going to need to sort of squeeze it together in some sort of way until it dries and probably something like this will do the trick although it will it will stick on it um, it will allow me to clamp the vise in place a little bit and then we can soak the paper off or scrape or sand the paper off afterwards anyway I'm going to leave that at that once I've fixed that I will sand gently around the edge and then hopefully it will stay, or well, drill through and then it will stay in place for a lot longer um, for many years to come. A small repair, better than snapping it off and being left with a broken one. Thank you for watching. Hope you weren't too shocked or offended by the use of an uh, adjustable tusk nut on a classic vintage Gibson. Like I say, you can now revert back um, at your own leisure if you want to for a resale or whatever. But this gives great tuning stability now from here on inwards. Um, all, I'm, all I'm seeing, the, the concern I had, all I'm seeing is actually what a precise thing like this machined tusk nut shows me is that actually the original radius now of this is probably not and may, may not even ever have been uh, a dead 12. So it's, um, or maybe it's become less around the edges due to whatever fret work it's had in the past. but. So there's a very, very slight mismatch, but actually I don't think you'll notice. I don't think you noticed it before um, um, because probably the nut was cut down to match. But with this, I don't, the whole point of this to get the tuning stability is I don't want to cut down into the slots. And actually I don't think you need to. Um, you can play it and you'll, I think you'll agree that it's pretty good as it is. Um, there's the little hex key that goes with the adjustable Nut. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching. See you again at Relove Guitars. Thank you for support and um, subscriptions and so on and so on. I'm past 14,000 subscribers and I'm not a very regular poster because at the moment I'm, um, I'm still, well, I'm just getting back up on my, on my feet in this new place. But also um, I'm, I'm collecting up the next lot of videos to send off to Bert in the States to upload and he's blindingly fast broadband for me um, or I dial in and, and do it so uh, that's how I'm doing it at the moment but I'm also investigating at the moment getting a, an airband line of sight um, connection to this new workshop um, which may mean I can do it but we'll have to see it uh, they may not be able to get the line of sight to this place it's kind of it's sort of rural and remote but if they can it's it's not a bad deal it's about 40 quid a month which considering the rent I'm paying it's very low I, I can't complain um, and if it gives me a chance to do live things and um, you know uh, upload more regular content then that's good because at the moment I know I'm like some bloke who appears every month or so which isn't fantastic for having a, a dialogue with people <laughs> but thanks for sticking with it anyway I know there's a certain number of people who, who regularly watch and I know there's a, a lot who just hit the subscribe button and perhaps never watch again like I do with lots of things but uh, thank you for all for your comments and support over the years. It's been nearly six years, six years coming up, about now actually, just about six years. And um, I'm actually very proud of, of what I've created with Reloved. Um, against the odds, I haven't borrowed money to do it. I haven't um, you know, got <laughs> gone out of business in tough times. Um, we just, just managed to keep it going by doing the best work I can do um, on a regular basis. Um, and going the extra mile, like little things like the fixing on that. So um, appreciate all the support and see you more regularly in the new year. Thanks for watching.